I really haven't covered many DC movies on this channel, which is odd considering the first movie review I did was on a DC movie. Well, with Batman v Superman around the corner, it's time to change that. But the big question is, will I be smart enough to be able to review these movies? According to Warner Brothers, Batman v Superman might be too smart for Marvel fans. And it's easy to see how that could be. Simply look at their past brilliance. Edward Nygma, come on down! You're the next contestant on Brain Drain! I'm sucking up your IQ. Vacuuming cortex. Feeding off your brain. Batman Forever was the first of two Batman movies directed by Joel Schumacher. Warner Brothers had given Tim Burton fairly free reign to make whatever movie he wanted when he made Batman Returns. And in turn, they got Batman Returns, a successful movie that many families found too disturbing. It still could be worse. My nose could be gushing blood. My nose could be... And they did have good reasons. Even though Batman Returns was a success, it wasn't nearly as big as 1989's Batman. The studio decided it would be a good idea for the third installment to be a bit lighter. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through With that, Tim Burton decided to leave the project. Michael Keaton also stepped down from the title role, turning down the $15 million offered for him to reprise the character. The recasting wouldn't stop there. Tommy Lee Jones was cast as Harvey Dent, despite the fact that the character was already featured in 1989's Batman. These recastings created strife on the set, just not the way you'd expect. According to Joel Schumacher, Val Kilmer and Tommy Lee Jones proved to be rough to work with. Schumacher called Kilmer childish and impossible. Jones reportedly told Jim Carrey, I hate you. I really don't like you. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. Carrie would confirm that Jones was difficult to work with. This new movie in the franchise would have a new tone that was still dark, but not nearly as dark as the previous two entries, and with tones borrowed from the 60s television series. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. This movie was also supposed to have more of a Batman focus where elements of his origin are examined, as he sees himself reflected in Dick Grayson. This would prove to be some of the strongest parts of the film. So naturally, these elements would end up on the cutting room floor. Needless to say, the film was a bit less than perfect. <laughs> What, as opposed to room temperature acid? Wow, so they're taking the awesome looking car from Tim Burton's first two movies and adding lights and shit to the car for no goddamn reason? It wasn't broke, but they decided to fix it. And by fixing it, they managed to break it. Great job, guys. For me to pop on! When Michael Keaton stepped down and Val Kilmer was cast as the new caped crusader, I assumed we'd lose the borderline insane Batman that Keaton gave us. You know what happened to this guy, Jack? Well, made mistakes. And then he had us. Now you want to get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. In favor of a more stoic Batman that you usually see in the comic books. And this proved to be completely accurate. But sadly, in this case, stoic means far more boring. Thanks. Kilmore just seems bland in a lot of his scenes, and he just says his lines frequently like he's reading them. What's wrong? There's almost no passion to his performance. We all wear masks. Don't get me wrong, he's not terrible, just rather flavorless. It just raises too many questions. 
His Bruce and Batman are by far the most interchangeable of any other actor to tackle the role in my lifetime. Bruce Wayne is a stoic and noble billionaire. Batman is a stoic and noble vigilante. Really, about the same, except one wears a suit and one wears a costume. What's the biggest crime here is that Kilmer actually does a really good job in this movie, but literally, his best scenes were cut. Some of it was resurrected in Batman Begins, but a lot of it is just lost. One of the best bits shows how Bruce is having trouble separating Bruce from Batman and how he has trouble identifying who he really is. Who am I, Alfred? I don't know anymore. That would make their interchangeability part of the movie. But since the scenes are cut, that element is lost from the movie proper. And since I'm reviewing the movie This Is instead of the movie It Should Be, I have to say Val Kilmer in the movie proper is just bland. He's the celery of Batman actors. What this means in the end is that we get a bland performance from Val Kilmer, and it's not even Kilmer's fault. He actually gives a good performance that end up on the cutting room floor, and we're left with just the blandest crap he did it left in the final movie. It's the car, right? Chicks love the car. Yet somehow that wasn't cut. This was when it was starting to become clear that these movies were less interested in getting actors who would do a good job with the role and more interested in stunt casting. Although the other movies weren't immune to this, that's how we got Danny DeVito's version of the Penguin. Here, we get Jim Carrey's version of the Riddler, which honestly has moments of feeling like it could be the Riddler proper. You are fired! Do you hear me? Fired! I don't think so. But most of the time, it really just felt like Jim Carrey doing his shtick wearing a codpiece. The crazy thing is, I guarantee you this isn't Jim Carrey's fault. In fact, looking at Jim Carrey's range in his career, I'm betting he will have actually pulled off a really awesome Riddler proper. But I'm certain he was directed to play the character with as much of his shtick as he can. If I was a superhero, where would I have? I'm not sure if it was Schumacher or a producer or Warner Brothers who told Carrie to play the character this way, but it's just terrible and doesn't fit the character at all. Now you could argue that Jim Carrey's Riddler just borrows a lot from Frank Gershon's Riddler from the classic TV series. Commodore Schmidlap's invention in our hands, the whole world almost literally in our grasp, and Batman and Robin still alive to block us. But I call bullshit on that. I think it's pretty clear this Riddler is pretty much just borrowing from Ace Ventura. Oh, righty then. In a rather jarring cut, we see Batman driving around Gotham in the Batmobile when suddenly an apparent homeless man goes across the street only to reveal himself to be Two-Face. And what happens is an action scene that literally adds nothing to the story. We learn nothing new about the characters. We learn nothing new about the plot. It's not even like this movie needs more action. It has plenty already. And yet they jam this in the movie for no reason. Literally, of all the scenes in the movie to cut, they leave this one in? What were the editors thinking? The Riddler makes advice to create 3D television because, as history has shown us, 3D conversions always look great. But it's even worse than that. I have no idea how this works, which is an issue, since I should be concerned about the people of Gotham getting this insidious device. It's implied that drains IQ, but then it seems to drain memories. Is this stuff just copied over to the Riddler, or does the original person lose that information? The word drain certainly implies the original person loses the memories or the IQ points or whatever. 
Is Bruce Wayne now dumber than he was at the beginning of the movie? Is Riddler now smarter? He never seems any smarter. Honestly, what does this device do? I don't understand at all. It seems like something that should be a real threat to everyone in Gotham, but for all its bolster and apparent power, the villains only use it to find out Batman's secret identity. That's it. Riddle me this. What kind of a man has bats on the brain? Of all the creative ways you could use a device that could steal the memories of everyone in town, and that's all they use it for. It just seems like such a waste. It just raises too many questions. I'm out of here. Excuse me? Look, I figured telling that cop I'd stay here for a while save me a truckload of social service interviews and charity, so, uh... Uh, this is just bizarre. Apparently social services leave Dick Grayson with Bruce Wayne... Why? I mean, he looks like he's like 30. Can you adopt a 30-year-old orphan? Is that a common thing in Gotham? It just raises too many questions. It is a shame that Billy D. Williams didn't get to follow through with the character he played in 1989's Batman. However, Tommy Lee Jones seemed like a great idea for the character. The animated series had already shown people the multiple personalities of Harvey Dent. So, this movie's casting seems like it should work perfectly. Jones can play Harvey Dent like Sam Gerard from The Fugitive. I didn't kill my wife! I don't care! And he can play the evil criminal Two-Face like William Stranax in Under Siege. Tom Breaker, cancel Operation Cleopatra, and shortly thereafter, two young men from Langley showed up in Miami, tried to cancel me along with it. You received each man's right forefinger in the mail, didn't you, Tom? If he followed this pattern, he would be perfect. But instead, they just made him generic baddie Joker knockoff. Yes, 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 oh, happy day. <laughs> Night rat. Why write into this movie a character as interesting as Two-Face and cast an actor clearly capable of portraying the character's death, only just to crap up another generic evil villain character? I don't want to make it seem like they don't have any moments to this character, because there's exactly one. Yes, of course you're right, Bruce. Emotion's always the enemy of true justice. Thank you. You've always been a good friend said right before he dies. Essentially, this line is attempting to cash a check the rest of the movie Dent write. At no point is it established that Dent and Wayne even know each other. Dent seems completely unfazed by the reveal that Bruce Wayne is Batman. <laughs> Go ahead. You can say it. You're a genius. Stop. Stop. <laughs> And you'd think you'd be surprised to discover your good friend dresses up like a bat and fights crime. They had opportunities to add some depth to the character. They established that Batman was there when Two-Face got his scars. Maybe Bruce blames himself for what happened to Two-Face. Take advantage of the rich history of these two characters. But rather than do that, they just have a scene like this. Oh. I mean, come on, they even have a scene early in the movie when they're introducing Two-Face to us, explaining the point of the coin. You're a gambling man. Let's say we flip for it. Babies starve, politicians grow fat, holy men are martyred, and junkies grow legion. Why? <laughs> Luck! Simple do-da, clueless! Luck! <laughs> <laughs> The random toss. <sighs> the only true justice. And despite the fact that flies in the face of comic book Two-Face and animated series Two-Face, and even this movie's Two-Face, they have him flipping the coin, hoping to get the result he wants. Even if you want to claim the character is a unique invention of the movie and not meant to draw directly upon any of the source material, then still, the internal logic of the character fails. Which means even if I don't judge this based on any of the source material, this character still sucks quite a bit. It just raises too many questions. This movie doesn't do anything all that bad aside from the odd line here and there. Women. And the introduction of bat nipples, of course. But 
on the other side of that coin, the movie also doesn't do anything all that good. It is possible to sit down for the two hour runtime and enjoy the film for what it is. But five minutes after it's over, you're probably gonna have a hard time recalling any cool moments. This film has its defenders, largely for the material that was cut out. And honestly, the stuff cut out is really good. If you think about Chase's obsessive fascination with Batman, plays so much more into the narrative when you consider that in the original script, Bruce Wayne was having trouble differentiating himself from Batman. But it's not part of the movie. This movie comes off as nothing more than a watering down of the franchise established in the first two films. And while I do agree that the franchise could use a little watering down after Batman Returns, it doesn't need watered down to the point where nothing stands out. Batman Returns had more bad elements than this movie, Bye. Bye, big baby. but also had more good elements. This movie hits everything on a perfectly bland level. I give it a 3 out of 10.